on World News Tonight. Deadly flood waters. Trouble after trouble for the Indian subcontinent as flash floods in Nepal leaped one dead and dozens injured. High stakes. The world looks on in anticipation as Anthony Blinken meets his Chinese counterpart in Beijing. No more smoke. Swiss voters back zero emissions referendum as calls for immediate climate action take center stage worldwide. Aloha Mora. The doors are open in a Japanese Harry Potter museum for Potterheads and fans alike to come and live their magical dreams in real life. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Very good evening and you are watching World News and we are starting off today with Nepal as the Indian subcontinent is propelled further into experiencing severe weather. One person was killed and at least 25 others were missing in flash floods and landslides triggered by heavy rains that battered East Nepal. Uh, the first known fatality since the annual rains began last week. Heavy rains washed away a hydroelectric project under construction on the Hewa River in Sanku Wasaba district in Nepal, where 16 workers have gone missing, said Bimal Paudel, a government official. Video footage taken by eyewitnesses showed the aftermath with mud and rocks along the ravaging Hewa River near the damaged hydroelectric plant. Nine people were also missing in flash floods and landslides in neighboring Taplejung and Panchthar districts, bordering India in the east. Annual rains, which are crucial for crops, normally begin in mid-June and continuing through September in Nepal. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken sat down with China's top diplomat on the final day of a high-stakes visit to Beijing aimed at stabilizing relations with a cater catering to the wake of a dispute over the Chinese surveillance balloon. All eyes are on whether Washington's envoy will meet Chinese leader Xi Jinping later in the day for what could be a crucial step in patching fractured ties. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gong held what they called candid and constructive talks Sunday in Beijing, though they seemed to agree on little beyond keeping the conversation going. After a five-and-a-half-hour meeting followed by a dinner, the State Department said Blinken stressed the need to reduce the risk of misperception and miscalculation, which was what he listed as his top objective for the meeting on Friday in Washington. To establish open and empowered communications uh, so that our two countries responsibly manage our relationship, including by discussing challenges, by addressing misperceptions, and avoiding miscalculations. Chinese state media quoted Chin as having pointed out that the Taiwan issue is the core of China's core interests, the most important issue in Sino-U.S. relations, and the most prominent risk. Ties between the countries have deteriorated across the board, raising concern they might one day clash militarily over the self-governed island of Taiwan, which China claims as its own. The trip was the first visit to China by a U.S. Secretary of State in five years. Blinken postponed a February trip after a suspected Chinese spy balloon flew over U.S. airspace. He is the highest-ranking U.S. government official to visit since President Joe Biden took office in January 2021. Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping met in Bali in November. During his stay through Monday, Blinken is also expected to meet with China's top diplomat Wang Yi and possibly Xi. Blinken and Foreign Minister Chin plan to meet again in Washington at some future date. North Korea has labeled its recent failed attempt to launching a spy satellite a serious failure while vying to make another attempt in the near future. This marks a rare occasion where the regime has admitted failure, but what are the possible reasons? Take a look. On May 31st, a North Korean rocket carrying a military spy satellite crashed into the sea soon after liftoff. The failed launch was described as the most serious failure by the North at the ruling party's latest key meeting with leader Kim Jong-un in attendance. The North state media said Monday that the officials responsible for the launch were criticized and were told to analyze the cause of the failure so that a military reconnaissance satellite can be successfully launched in the near future. But it did not elaborate on when exactly the next launch will take place. An expert told that it's not typical for the regime to admit failure and suggested two possible reasons as to why the North may have done this. 
Firstly, because it's obvious that the launch failed, as South Korea has already retrieved parts of the rocket, and the information might have leaked to the North Korean public. And secondly, it needs North Korean scientists to take risks in order to make the regime's space program successful. The North Korean regime wants to make sure that its own internal scientific apparatus stays committed to constructing these things and building these things and keeps on trying and trying, right? And if the North Koreans' attitude towards failure is that scientists get, you know, purged or they lose their privileges or whatever, if these launches fail, right, then that means you can never admit failure, which means the scientists won't take the necessary chances and risks and stuff like that. He also added that this is what makes the current Kim Jong-un regime different from the previous regime. Kim Jong-un is a little bit more aware that these things aren't always going to go smoothly, and he's willing to admit that. And that should help in the long term. That should help the program be more successful. U.S. President Joe Biden, in another classic gaffe, ended his speech on the state of gun control, saying, quote, God save the queen, man. Biden was in Connecticut, where he marked one year since the first major gun safety measure in a generation was passed. This is not the first time that Biden has made a gap while addressing a large audience. And if you can see the camera, they can see you. And uh, it's the least consequential part of this whole meeting for you. I promise. All right. God save the queen, man. Hello, organized labor. U.S. President Joe Biden held his first political rally Saturday since launching his re-election campaign in April. He made his 2024 pitch to union members in Philadelphia. The AFL-CIO, which endorsed Biden this week, hosted the event. It includes 60 unions representing more than 12.5 million workers. Biden is aiming to shore up a key part of his political coalition and bolster support among white working class voters. There's not a politician in this country who can't say the word union. Because you know I'm not one of them. I'm proud to say the word. I'm proud to be the most pro-union president in American history. Biden has supported collective bargaining at companies, reversed rules implemented by his Republican predecessor and leading challenger Donald Trump that weaken worker protections, pushed to reverse a decades-long decline in union membership, and made it easier for union labor to build bridges and ports around the country. In his remarks, Biden talked up his $1.2 trillion infrastructure package, passed with bipartisan support in Congress. Infrastructure was the subject of a visit he made earlier in the day. Biden toured the scene of a collapsed section of the I-95 highway in Pennsylvania. He promised $3 million in initial emergency funding and pledged to rebuild it in record time. We're going to stay with you and this is rebuilt until it's totally finished. We're going to try to do that in as quick a time as possible. And I told the governor there's no more important project right now in the country as far as I'm concerned. I've directed my team, not figuratively, but literally, to move heaven and earth to get it done as soon as humanly possible. A section of I-95 was shut down in both directions after a tanker truck hauling gasoline caught fire on Sunday, causing the concrete to buckle and collapse. Authorities have not said precisely how the fuel was ignited. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that his government, the most right-wing in the country's history, will move forward with its controversial judicial overhaul. The move which is likely to re uh, reignite the massive protests that gripped the country for the weeks earlier. This year comes after the opposition withdrew from negotiations to reach an agreement. Taking aim at his opponents, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed on Sunday to plow on with the controversial plan to change the country's judicial system. We gave it a month, and then another month, and then another month, three months overall. The representatives of the opposition wouldn't agree to the most basic things. The intention was just to waste time. That's why we will meet this week and start with active steps. We will take them in a measured, responsible manner, but in accordance with the mandate we were given to bring corrections to the judicial system. The overhaul has sparked a wave of unprecedented protests. The most recent one took place this Saturday, a day before Netanyahu's latest announcement. Faced with the backlash, the prime minister had put the reform on hold in March. He said he wanted to make room for time to reach a wide consensus on the issue. But last week, 
Israel's opposition announced it was suspending its participation in the compromise talks, following a spat over a committee tasked with appointing judges, one of the focal points of the resistance to the overhaul. The reform would also curb the power of the Supreme Court, currently the only institution in the country that can review legislation passed by majority in parliament. On Sunday, opposition lawmaker Yair Lapid did not mince his words. Netanyahu's announcement that he intends to unilaterally move forward with the coup will critically harm the economy, endanger security, and tear the Israeli people to shreds. Protest leaders have said they're ready for another round of demonstrations and disruptions. They vowed to thwart what they described as any attempt to harm the judicial system and Israel's democracy. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now over to the war in Ukraine. The death toll has risen to 52, with Russian officials saying 35 people have died in Moscow-controlled areas and Ukraine's interior minister saying 17 had died and 31 were missing. More than 11,000 have been evacuated on both sides. Officials in Ukraine said the death toll from flooding following the destruction of the Kohovka Dam has risen to 16, and Russian officials said 29 people have died in territories that Moscow controls. The breach here of the Kohovka Dam on June 6 unleashed floodwaters across a large area of land in southern Ukraine and in Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine, destroying farmland and cutting off supplies to civilians. More than 3,600 people have been evacuated from the flooded areas in the Kherson and Mykolaiv regions, while 31 people were still missing and some 1,300 houses remained flooded. That's according to Ukraine's Interior Ministry. Here in Holopristan, a city in Russian-controlled Ukraine, volunteers were seen pumping flood water out of homes on Saturday. This woman says her only hope is God. We don't put our hopes in any of the authorities, she says. Ukraine accuses Russia of blowing up the Soviet-era dam under Russian control since early days of its invasion in 2022. A team of international legal experts assisting Ukraine's prosecutors in their investigation said in preliminary findings on Friday it was highly likely the collapse in Ukraine's Kherson region was caused by explosives planted by Russians. The Kremlin accuses Kyiv of sabotaging the hydroelectric dam, which held a reservoir the size of the US Great Salt Lake, to cut off a key source of water for Crimea and distract attention from a quote faltering counteroffensive against Russian forces. Voters in Switzerland have backed a new climate bill designed to cut fossil fuel use and reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The government says the country needs to protect its energy security and the environment as glaciers melt rapidly in the Swiss Alps. The law will require a move away from dependence on imported oil and gas towards the use of renewable sources. It's being hailed as a major victory. Over 59% of Swiss voters give the green light to a bill aimed at reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. I feel very moved. I'm happy, but not only because we won, not only because we won happily, but because I'm here with all of you and because I realised how great our team is and how I like so many people with whom we managed to get this result. At the heart of the legislation, slashing the country's dependence on imported oil and gas and looking to greener and more homegrown alternatives instead. To achieve this, the legislation will release 2 billion Swiss francs as well as additional aid for businesses. Reaching carbon neutrality will be a massive feat for the country, which imports around three quarters of its energy. But the stakes are high, with glaciers in the Alps melting at an alarming rate. They lost a third of their volume between 2001 and 2022. The law has divided politicians. The Nationalist Swiss People's Party, which has long been against the legislation, say the measures will cause energy bills to rise. Alongside the climate bill, a second referendum on Sunday also saw voters overwhelmingly back the introduction of a 15% minimum tax rate on businesses, paving the way for Switzerland to join an international agreement led by the OECD. 
The coronavirus was the focus of a third vote. Nearly 70% of citizens agreed to extend the country's emergency COVID-19 law until 2024. Max Verstappen made its six victories with eight races in 2023 with dominant display during Sunday's Canadian Grand Prix, leading home the Aston Martin of Fernando Alonso and Mercedes's Lewis Hamilton as Red Bull maintained their 100% winning record for the season so far. Alonso and Hamilton traded places on multiple occasions throughout the race and Hamilton getting the jump at the start but falling back behind when the strategies unfolded. Max Verstappen won the Canadian Grand Prix from pole position to stretch his Formula 1 championship lead and take Red Bull's milestone 100th victory. The Dutch 25-year-old led every lap and he took his career tally to 41 wins, stepping up alongside Brazil's late triple champion Ayrton Senna in the record books. Fernando Alonso finished second for Aston Martin at Montreal circuit. Gilles Villeneuve, the Spaniard's sixth podium in eight races, with Britain's seven times world champion Lewis Hamilton third for Mercedes. The podium for this year's Grand Prix came across as somewhat special, considering all three podium standards were F1 world champions, with Lewis Hamilton having seven and the other two sharing two titles each, adding prestige to the podium. While Red Bull toasted landmark victory, it was not a perfect day for the team as Sergio Perez's worrying run for below par performances continued with the Mexican failing to get on the podium for the third consecutive race. After a subpar qualifying effort that saw him start 12th, Perez moved up to finish 6th and take the bonus point for the fastest lap. Lewis Hamilton's third place provided more proof that Mercedes are heading in the right direction as the team looks to close the gap on the rampaging Red Bulls. It is the second consecutive Grand Prix Hamilton has appeared on the podium while teammate George Russell had looked a threat until spinning into the wall early in the race, damaging his car. For the second straight year, Verstappen won from pole on the island circuit. Lewis Hamilton, on the other hand, proved to all critics that he is still on the top of his game as he extended his record for having most podiums in F1 history to 195. The seven-time world champion later stated that he is confident that his team will be back on where they belong at the front of the grid, fighting for the championship. Families in a Ugandan border town have begun burying their loved ones who died after school was targeted by suspected extremist rebels. The attack in the town of Mpondre Lubiri had left 38 students, a school guard and three civilians dead. Shock and disbelief. That is the general feeling in this small Ugandan village, which witnessed an unprecedented massacre on Friday night. Dozens of secondary school students were killed after assailants broke into the premises, setting fire to the pupils' dormitory building. Some of the victims were burned beyond recognition. Others were shot or stabbed to death. Right now we are here trying to put together the dead bodies that are beyond, were burnt beyond recognition uh, in the hostel so that they can be partitioned and numbered to enable them to follow up their DNA as the parents come to claim their uh, students who have been here. Out of those lucky enough to survive, several were injured, while others have been kidnapped. Authorities are blaming the attack on five men, members of the Allied Democratic Forces, an Islamist militia that has been rebelling against the Ugandan government since the 90s and pledged allegiance to the Islamic State Group in 2017. According to the Ugandan military, they are in hot pursuit of the attackers. However, some are taking out their anger on the security forces that they say should have been protecting their fellow citizens. If they are telling us the borders are secured, security is tight. I want the security to tell us where they were when these killers came, uh, came to kill our people. Uh, should, should we say they are rebels that came to kill our people? Is this security within Uganda? Why is it that we see them scattered here? Where were they at night? It's believed that the five men have fled with the hostages over the border into the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the army is currently conducting an operation. 
Voting concluded in Mali on a new constitution in the ruling junta's first electoral test with insecurity and political disagreement preventing voting in some areas. The West African nation has been under military rule since an August 2020 coup, but strongman leader Colonel Asim Goita has vowed to return to the country to civilian rule in 2024. It's a referendum that has been called for by ECOWAS but postponed several times. A first step towards a return to constitutional order with elections in February 2024 on the horizon. Mali's new constitution proposes an overhaul of the state's institutions with the creation of a Senate, a Court of Audit and decentralised regional governments. 13 of Mali's national languages will gain official status while French will be reduced to being a working language. But the constitution would also bolster the powers of the head of state. The president would name the prime minister and cabinet members. He would in effect determine the country's policy and could even himself submit laws. The new constitution would consolidate the secular nature of the Malian state. This has been opposed by some 20 Islamic organizations. This first poll since 2020 and Colonel Asimi Goita's coup d'etat is set to be a challenge. Voting, for instance, will not be able to take place in Kidal, the region in the north, dominated by former separatist rebels who are opposed to the referendum. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Pope Francis gave his regular Sunday address in Vatican City and thanked supporters following his nine-day hospitalization for abdominal surgery. His return was met with a crowd chanting, Long live the Pope. All 120 passengers and crew members aboard a Philippine ferry that caught fire at sea were rescued safely and the fire was extinguished. The MV Esperanza star caught fire at dawn while traveling from Sikujo province to Bohol province in central Philippines with 65 passengers and 55 crew members. Australia's Senate passed legislation that paves the way for the country to hold a landmark referendum later this year on whether to recognize its indigenous people in the constitution. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese will now have to set a referendum date which must happen no sooner than two months and no later than six months. At least 20 people were shot, one fatally, at a Juneteenth celebration outside Chicago shortly after midnight. Police say that they are still investigating the motive and number of shooters involved. Dozens of relatives of disappeared people attended a mass in Mexico City's Guadalupe Basilica hoping to bring awareness to their cause. Relatives searching for their loved ones hope that this mass and the meeting will help raise awareness amongst Mexicans and authorities about the search for people who go missing in the country because of violence. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we finish off in Japan, where Harry Potter fans will soon be able to take up their wands, put on their robes, and immerse themselves in the wizarding world. And a studio tour set to open in Tokyo. Stay safe and have a good night.